Welcome to the Critical Accounting Podcast. I'm here with Professor Keith Hoskin of the University of Birmingham. Uh, my name's James Brackley. Um, so welcome, Keith. It's great to have you here. And it's a great pleasure to be, in a sense, launching this podcast, hopefully, series. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, it's great to have you, and it's great to have uh, someone who's got such a long history in, in, in the field uh, and so it's such a rich, I think, range of... Uh, you know, writings and thought. Um, I wanted to ask you to begin with a little bit about the kind of history of critical accounting discipline. Perhaps for people who are listening to this who are maybe new and not so sure what, what is critical accounting and uh, where does it come from. Um, your background is in kind of classics and education um, and you kind of came into the field. What, so we're going back, we're talking 1970s, 1980s, I think. What drew you towards critical accounting at that time and and how would you explain critical account, what is critical accounting to, uh, uh, to somebody who might be new to it? Okay. Um, well, I think it's a sort of two-part answer, probably, James. The first part being that I never intended to be involved in accounting in anything but a very distant way. I knew nothing about it. Um, but I was, as you said, I had a background in classical languages, and I also studied medieval and modern Greek. I then got a scholarship to go to the States, one of these sort of Anglo-American scholarships. And what I was always interested in was learning. So what I wanted to study was learning. And no doubt they had a graduate school of education at the University of Pennsylvania, where my scholarship was tenable. And uh, so I thought, oh, I'll do that. I'll do educational psychology, master's. And then I get there and find what well, Graduate School of Education is, is just the Ivy League term for the teacher training sort of institution, mainly. But there was research as well. And I actually got into educational history. Um, no notion being critical, just trying to study this. And I did a PhD, did this master's in educational psychology and thought it was very odd because it never talked about learning hardly at all, as it still doesn't. Uh, we could do cognitive science now, whatever that is. So through this, I actually ended up getting a PhD in educational history, which was actually about Roman and Greek education and about the f significance of rhetoric at the heart of all of that. And then I got a job, but not in the States, back in this country. Um, and I was teaching in a department which was not teacher training. It was a very small department studying education as a knowledge field. And I was the historian engaged in that. And right about this time, coming back to the UK in the early to mid 1970s, there already was a critical mass of critical education work, largely based at the Institute of Education in London. Um, key person was Michael Young, not Michael F.D. Young, that was. There was a book, Knowledge and Control, which was bringing in mainly Marxist, um, but other sorts of radical humanist approaches to rethinking what education is. And that really gathered speed as a field. And you could say that critical accounting wasn't following that precisely, but it was part of that move and really begins with Anthony Hopwood having founded accounting organisations and society as sort of the leading, used to be seen just as the leading critical journal, was the only journal that carried the critical stuff on accounting. But even in its early years, it didn't do a lot of that. It's really the early 1980s before there begins to formalise a kind of group of people who are, can then, by the mid 1980s, see themselves as doing something like critical accounting. So I, in a way, wasn't looking at accounting. I was looking at education and thinking more and more about how do you do a critical analysis of education to understand how we learn, how we function today? How does that relate to how we learned and functioned in the past? And in the context of that, someone introduced me to this French work by this guy called Michel Foucault, 
book was called Discipline and Punish. It was a sociology professor at Warwick, because that was where I'd ended up, the University of Warwick, who uh, told me about it. So you might be interested in this. I'd never heard of Foucault and I started to read the book. Very difficult. Couldn't understand it at all, except that right in the middle of the book, he talks about examination and says examination is this extraordinary exchanger of knowledge and it turns people into a field of knowledge because you must study to get through these examinations and he uses that as the key sort of technique or technology where power relations and knowledge relations come together and of course quite a number of people in the critical accounting were using Foucault and the notion of the power and knowledge relations and I was doing that in education and as part of that, I was looking at how did modern exams come about? First looked in England and discovered mid 18th century, late, later 18th century, Cambridge introduces uh, having to write answers for the maths tripos. Totally, totally voluntary. But then they start ranking people into different categories. And the ones right at the top um, are getting chosen by the heads of Cambridge colleges. It was all corrupt in the sense of it wasn't meritocratic, as we could say. So somebody suggests in about 1790, we should have numerical marks for these exams. It's the only way we can guarantee that the leading academics in the university won't just promote their favourites to the top positions. So then I thought, it would be interesting since I studied in the States to see how this works out there, because at that point, the early colleges like Harvard and Yale, which are tiny. I mean, in 1800, there are 20, 21 colleges in the US. None of them big, m most of them smaller than individual colleges in Oxford and Cambridge, and they follow that Oxbridge model. So how did they get into this? And I had money to go around all of these places and talk to people and look at their archives and you find late 18th century at Yale, the first place, then at Princeton, then weirdly at the University Military Academy at West Point and at Yale, both coming up with grading systems very much the same time. The Yale one actually is based on a sort of, if you're really good, you get almost four on a, on a course. And this is lovely histories of these sorts of things, what gets embedded. How do you get, how do you get graded in, in American universities? On the four point scale, A is a four, B three, C and so on. Why a four point scale? Because it's Yale and it's the first one that's used in a US college. So it disseminates out. So I'm looking at all of that. And at the same time, I had a friend from university who I'd studied classics with called Richard McVee. He was in the States when I was in the States. Um, I had an amazing kind of airplane ticket for like six months, no, maybe it was four months from TWA for like 300 pounds, which I got on a research grant. I could fly anywhere in the US that TWA served for as many times as I wanted. It was like a sort of Red Rover bus ticket that they used to have, just go anywhere or the Eurail pass. So I did, and he was in Houston, I was up in Philadelphia, but I flew down for the Easter weekend. And we talked and I said, well, I'm looking at exams. And I said, what I'm interested in is that is the relation between what the exam result gives you. It's a measure of performance. But what you're trying to get to underneath that is a measure of competence. What is the quality of the person? But that you can't measure that. And he said, oh, he said, oh, you mean it's just like accounting? And I said, no, Richard, no, accounting tells you the truth about this, that and the other. He said, no, it doesn't. It has to do exactly the same. All you've got are measures of performance and you then imply underlying value from that. And that's the game you always have to be playing. Now, Richard, at that point had become, he, he 
left university, didn't know, like me, what we're going to do. I got a scholarship to go to the States. He was just in England and his father was a chartered accountant. So he said, take the accountancy exams, which he did. And of course, he's a very smart guy and he came top in all the exams and got all the prizes, basically. And um, then was seduced into the LSE from having worked for Pete Marwick's, which was a, a forerunner of uh, the big name firms now that are now just three letter acronyms on the whole. Um, and they got him to do a master's and he then became a professor at Aberystwyth. But he was not seen as critical. But to talking to me, he was. So out of that, we said, well, maybe we should pull what we've got, but these things are somehow the same. And what I was bringing was the notion of the examination as something that remakes how you are as people, particularly once you get examinations that grade you numerically and frequently ask you to write. This is all new in the West. So we then wrote this piece together, which eventually came out in AOS, or Accounting Organisations and Society, we call it AOS, in 1986, but had been submitted the year before to the first ever Interdisciplinary Perspectives in Accounting Conference. And Richard said to me, that, well, they'll probably just throw it out because they know me, they know I'm not critical, and they probably won't be interested in this, this sort of history of double entry bookkeeping. And it was reviewed by somebody who said, this is really important. This is one of the most important pieces I've read in years. Didn't know who it was. After the conference, it turned out it was this person called Anthony Hopwood, who was the editor, uh, was throughout his life, the chief editor of AOS. Um, and so he fast tracked it into AOS. Unlike most submissions today that go through however many, four, five, eight, <laughs> I think I've heard eight submissions before they get in, or maybe get rejected after the fifth one. It was just fast tracked in. Yeah. Um, so it's an in, in incredible sort of uh, serendipity and how that comes about of the, alongside the kind of the birth of the field as well. I mean, I, I found it interesting coming myself from the profession um, to kind of as well first discover the sort of critical accounting discipline. Um, and what Anthony Hopwood, I think, talks about as the rationalisation machine, not the answering machine. So accounting isn't just giving you the truth, isn't just giving you the answers. Um, and it's interesting thinking about the examination as a form of accounting. It's probably yeah. not obvious to people necessarily, yeah. but it's still incredibly prevalent now, isn't it? I mean, I, I for um, my own PhD recently, I remember looking at, I think it was the FRC wrote a, I think it was something in response to the um, review of kind of the audit marketplace. And they talked about how they see transparency and the true and fair view as being, quote, the whole essence of accounting. So it's interesting that that sort of has a quite a powerful, almost discursive traction to it, the idea that it is true, therefore we must follow the accounts. Mm. Um, would you be able to say a bit more about this kind of power knowledge sort of nexus and how accounting is quite influential in influencing behaviour. And I know particularly you've looked at management accounting, which is very much to do with control within the firm and the history of cost accounting uh, and so on. Um, and then all of this, I think, relates to some of the ideas you've developed from Foucault as well. So yeah, could you, could you yeah. be able to say a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it could start briefly with Foucault and the, this work, Discipline and Punish, which I then read and reread and gradually did begin to understand what I thought he was talking about, um, in the course of which I wrote a piece called The History of Education and the History of Writing, um, which was meant to be a review of what became a classic work, uh, Michael Clanch's From Memory to Written Record, which is about how in Western Europe, and particularly in Britain, uh, there is no literacy apart from terribly restricted literacy till about 1100 and then it takes off and you move from being a mainly oral culture of memory to being literate and how truth games change in a Foucault sense he talked about truth games um, 
So it was a review of that, but then it became a review of education and writing from ancient Mesopotamia, which I knew about by then. This was about 1980. Um, colleague in maths at Warwick, who was studying ancient Euclid maths, um, alerted me to work by this woman called Denise Mant Besserat, who would become famous later for this, this notion that the first writing comes from accounting. And accounting begins before writing with clay tokens, which are shapeable by hand. So you can put them into shapes, which you can then attribute a name to for something that you want to count. So in that sense, clay token accounting is a form of naming objects by the different shapes that you get to put the clay into and then counting them. And that seems to me to be fundamental to one way of defining what accounting is, is to say, well, it's a thing that always names things and then counts them. And indeed, it doesn't just name them, but it's like if we've got, let's say, sheep or cows, cattle, say, or we've got amounts of grain. What we actually name is all of these different cattle, or all of these different sheep as sheep or cattle with this token form. We abstract from the richness of those all different animals to a categorization. It's an abstraction. Even more so with amounts of grain, you have a normalized container of, for a volume of grain or a normalized jar for a volume of liquid and beer, oil, wine, whatever. So even before you get to writing, accounting always names things, always abstract in an abstracting way, always simplifies the world in, in so doing. It always does that and it continues to do that today. All accounts have, if, if you're alphabetic, will have the naming on the left and the numbering on the right. If you're uh, out of a syllabic language like Arabic, it'll be right to left. Or oh, it might be top to bottom, but we always have that kind of layout. We always name things, we always abstract from the world, and then we get a record of what has taken place. But because of having this record, we have possible projections of futures. So that's what accounting always does. It does it in different ways, different writing systems, different numbering systems, but it produces a work that is intriguing because it always counts as well as names. It's not just restricted to one language in the sense of a vernacular that we speak. Accounts or any texts that, that have number of systems in them as well as naming terms migrate easily across quotes, traditional language categories. And that's one of the ways that they spread. But they're always sub subtracting from the world some complexity to make the world look regular, normed, if you like, standards, and to project possible futures. Now, one of the things to me is when you look at a set of accounts, accountant tells you what has happened or what may have happened because they may be fraudulent. The entries may be fraudulent, but as long as they're in a good, a proper form of the way accounts in this particular world are laid out, you don't necessarily know they're fraudulent, but so they can be true, they can be false, but they're a basis for then seeing what you can do in future. But they never tell you what to do because they've reduced the complexity of the world. They've made it possible to see possible futures, but then it's up to you. You have to use your judgment skill or lack of judgment and skill to say, we will do X or we will do Y. And that's one of the problems with accounting. As you say, it's seen as being having things correct and right, and therefore, it tells you what to do. It has things correct and right if they're well formed and honestly entered for things that have happened up to now. But beyond that, we've been back in this world of uncertainty. Um, but unfortunately, one of the things that follows from accounting and then other systems that name and count like statistics is we develop probabilities. We develop risk. 
And then we see the world as manageable within our risk parameters. And you keep getting these events. They like to call them black swans now, where they turn out to be rather more frequent than you thought they would be. And your whole edifice of being able to manage via accounting projections of the future within probabilistic frames is incredibly rickety and tends to be liable to collapse. As we have seen many times in the last 30, 40 years, particularly. That's what Michael Callum talks about this framing and overflowing. You know, these things have been conceptualized in different ways. Yeah. Um, but this idea that the account at any given time is always incomplete. But also, I think what's really interesting is that the naming process then becomes accounting, reporting, and valuing. Um, it kind of works both ways. So it's in order to be able to value something, you first need to have been able to name something and that therefore uh, we name things that are easier to count and that also drives behavior. Exactly. I mean, this is exactly. The two bits of this early accounting, even before it becomes the first writing as clay tablet accounts in Mesopotamia made with um, in cuneiform letters, or well, no, signifiers, they're not letters. Oh, that's one of the biggest problems. If you would grow up in the West, you grow up with alphabetic writing and you wish everything to be alphabetic. Right down to all the stuff now with um, genetic stuff. You say that they used to talk about this as being an alphabet. Alphabets have between 20 and 30 signifiers. Never less than 20. Not if they're true alphabets, more than 30. At the genetic level, you've got millions of these things. It's not an alphabet, but it's our metaphor. I almost fell into it there myself. But ignoring that, what you have is this naming. And the bit that is so important that goes with that is the counting that begins with the clay tokens is one plus one plus one. But actually, since you've got these categories of like volumes of corn or grain that you're going to measure. What you measure is this object that, as you say, you've named something that's countable and you count it with this one plus one plus one system, which is actually, I'm, we now talk about it as accounting value units. You measure, the counting is in accounting value units. And of course, we now have, if we Arabic numerals, uh, we've got uh, one, and then we could have the sort of higher order, 10, 100, and so on. And it's very easy to, to work with. Now, if you've got that, then what you have is perhaps the, I think, the most powerful counting system in the history of human race. It's the first one. But when you get to like the 18th century, the 19th century, and the work I was doing on examinations, and you discover that they start grading them. How do they grade them? With accounting value units, yeah? Typically from zero to 100, or it may be some variant on, on that. You and, and I have worked in English universities or British universities, whatever you want to call it, but the grading systems there, zero to 100, but if you're in the more sort of arts fields, typically a first class mark is 70. Yeah. And a second two one is 60, two two is 50, third is 40, pass is 38 and 39. Right. So that's the honors classification. So in fact, you've only got effectively 71 to 37 as your numbers. This is what it used to be. Now, but there's still accounting value units with cutoffs at different points. And these moment, this moment where examinations became written and graded with new, this uh, accounting value units is the moment where accounting gets inside us at the level of us being human subjects. And we begin to value ourselves through versions of this accounting value units if we have a first to third class classification or pass and fail classification those who get into the first class are 
elite. They have got first class minds. They've not just first class marks. And that sort of categorization spreads hugely in the Anglo-Saxon world in the 19th century. And in that way, we then begin to quantify qualities. We often talk about it. We have the exam stuff from the mid 1800s. We have intelligence. Francis Gorton's hereditary genius talks about different categories of intelligence. And he uses to establish the top level of the what's going to be a normal distribution, Cambridge Maths Tripos marks from two years in the 1840s or early 1850s. And he constructs a distribution of everybody with sort of genius at the top and in the categories he used more on as the second from bottom and imbecile as the one at the bottom. So these num numerical categories get terribly powerful namings. More on an imbecile become terms of, well, abuse. Um, and also, of course, they are below a standard of normal. And whether normal is the 50th percentile, whether normal is very good high standard because we expect the best, or whether normal is just above abnormal. Three different ways you can lay the normal or the standard out. Near the top, 50% or somewhere below that, mm. where sheep are separated from goats. And um, so in that sense, looking at the exams was about telling part of the story that turned out to be an accounting story. And the work that I did with Richard on, which we are going back to at the moment to complete, which is all on how, do, how does the modern business enterprise as developed in the US take shape. And it's the way in which this kind of naming and counting using the um, accounting value units is internalized by people who study under it and then translate it into the running of business enterprises. And for us, not the industrial revolution makes modern management. That's not new anyway. And it's still argued over, of course, and there's arguments that are ongoing at the moment. But in our view, what takes place in the US is different at the level of constructing business entities from anything that goes before. The accounting that's used is different, both at the level of double entry bookkeeping becoming used to be able to establish profit or variations of profit, like return on investment. You can't do return on investment until you've clarified what's capital. And that's what happens at DuPont in the late 1800s, as Alfred Chandler talks about him, the visible hand and elsewhere. So you start using financial accounting differently. You develop management accounting, which is about figuring out costs but it's not just about costs because people had looked at costs, not if they did double entry bookkeeping, they did revenues and expenses. If you did charge discharge accounting, where you have stuff coming in, which you charge, and then you discharge it and you get some sort of usually cash flow out, you do look at costs, but it doesn't mean you optimize work activity and use of materials to produce an optimal cost. Of course, in the UK, it tends to be the lowest cost. But elsewhere, you don't necessarily have to do just on cost. You do look for optimal cost benefit returns. You look at optimal levels of staffing, retention of good people. But this whole kind of structure where you have the line of staff system, which is what Chandler talks about, where the staff function is in every department from the top to the bottom of each line, or if it's a matrix system, every, every department has accounting and statistical information being gathered and you can coordinate. I think, I think here Chandler's notion of administrative coordination is very significant. It's, it's never just about Foucault. Administrative coordination is a way of getting beyond just looking at 
what the accounting numbers tell you, you because of how you coordinate activity. And so all of the stuff with cost and management accounting, right from the 1830s, is looking to how do you turn man in Foucault's sense. Foucault talks about, you know, 19th century scenes, the invention of man, as in French, homme, which is therefore male and female, although in English it comes out as man, which is problematic. But anyway, the level of the human becomes remade because he talks about it as calculable man or a calculable person. And we think it should be the nameable and countable person because we get all these new categorizations for naming ourselves. Identity politics depends on constructing identities and then valuing who you are in terms of these. I love it on our TV now, we have um, credit rating adverts. Get this, get our system of credit rating. It'll make your credit rating better and you can show it to others and you'll be able to now afford not just to have a cheap little car and a cheap little house. You can have a really good car and a really good house because your credit rating tells us who you are. And you do start to see it everywhere. You see it in the you know, performance appraisal practices that yeah. go on within organizations uh, like you know, education, as you've already described. And, and you, know, you see it in healthcare, um, standard costing, or also investment decisions in terms yeah. of you know, what is measurable becomes what is, you know, you can make a case for it yeah. and then that therefore becomes established as fact or true or, yeah. or value for money. Yeah. Um, but then underlying that are all kinds of different assumptions in terms of uh, interest. You mentioned kind of, it made me think of the famous Oscar Wilde quote, knowing the cost of everything but the value of nothing. Mm -hmm. And we see that more and more now with austerity yeah. as well, kind yeah. of shifting some of this debate towards cost measurement and inputs rather than sort of outputs and outcomes. Yeah. But um, um, I just say two things on, on that. One is it's very interesting now that thoughtful people in finance are dealing with the problem of this kind of cash flow analysis when you're dealing with problems of the environment that are going to last for hundreds of years and possibly thousands of years. And of course, beyond 30 years on any any level of what a percentage return you set with DCF, it's virtually nothing. It's completely unusable. And so they are addressing that. You know, people are obviously with Stern in the lead, but it's now becoming a serious issue because what appeared to be a rational form of measurement is utterly non-rational for the biggest problems that we confront. And the other thing is, it's, it's both about norming and it's about identifying the best and the worst. So being number one, everything comes about being number one. And the other field, of course, that is so important with all that sort of stuff is sports. Now, if you look at sports, the history of sports, which I also looked at when I was doing the education stuff, and there was someone, uh, Mangan, I can't forget his first name now, he wrote a history of uh, sports in the English public schools. And basically, the one contribution of Britain, or the English elite, to modern disciplinary power knowledge relations is the invention of modern sports in the forms where you have a, a defined field, a defined time, a defined method of scoring to get points or scoring to get runs or scoring to take strokes in games like golf. All of these are, nearly all of them are developed by the English public schools and then disseminated at the universities American football is started by Americans who come over to Oxford and Cambridge, see the football being played and take their version of football. Princeton versus Rutgers in 1869 is the first game of collegiate football. There is no professional football now. But that, again, it still derives from the English public schools. And their response to being under this examining routine to me is to translate it into something that they manage for their purposes and you know, league tables the matter blah 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 all these things are hugely significant 
Sports metaphors keep getting used in business to take us towards being number one. Or in the famous Paul Davis ads from years ago, we're number two, but then we try harder. <laughs> I want to take you up on the quite recent paper you've mm -hmm. done with a uh, former colleague, Rob Charnock, here at the University of Birmingham. Uh, you looked at the SDGs and in particular SDG 13 um, and climate change and sustainability and method governance. Um, and in that paper you use Foucault and, and particularly you do kind of a really in-depth kind of document analysis um, and look at the kind of the genealogy of how facts are constructed that lead in towards, you know, the famous 1.5 degree target. Um, would you be able to say a little bit more about that paper? Yeah, yeah, sure. Rob was already, already working well within the whole climate change field, and now he's he's gone to a job outside academia, which is actually in that field, running an organisation that is committed to doing what we can to mitigate the worst effects of the, the climate crisis, climate disaster that's already upon us. So. He had that interest, but had studied at the LSE and so had encountered Foucauldian research in the LSE tradition. And he came here and here, here I was doing Foucauldian research in a non-LSE tradition because they are sociologists. And you know, Peter Miller and Nick Rose in their book on is it governing economic life, I think, yeah. Um, 2008, they say in the introduction, we decided not to be Foucault scholars, but to take things from Foucault and other 19th, you know, sort of French theorists looking at the 19th and 20th centuries and to bring this together in certain sorts of ways with apparatuses and so on. Fantastic work in governmentality, which is won many awards within sociology as well as being so widely used within accounting which is an interesting aspect of all of this. Stuff that's being done in accounting turns up in fields beyond it. And I think that's one of the, if you want to have a definition of critical accounting, it is, it's an approach to accounting that is reaching out or giving insights that may work very well in other social science fields, possibly beyond. So I think that's very important. The other bit of that was, in the sort of work that I do with Richard McVie and now with Anne Christine, Anne Christine Franson, it's all about taking Foucault as not just being about power knowledge relations, but being what he says he was, which was a professor of the history of systems of thought, and that systems of thought change occasionally in human history. When they do, we start naming new objects knowledge objects to be concerned about. We start maybe counting things in a different way. But beyond that, we operate in a discursive field where we have new knowledge approaches coming up, new knowledge forms getting defined. The huge one of modernity in our Anglo-Saxon sense of modernity is the transformation from 1800. Once these new exams came in, which is the proliferation of multiple disciplines and sub-disciplines. Never anything like that in the history of human knowledge within literate cultures. You get a few fields, but this completely changes. One way it changes at places like Oxford and Cambridge is they had oral exams and not very serious issues, no, no class of degree, most people just passed. When the new exams came in, students started to work really hard. They, can face, they faced this failure, success dynamic, and there were these professors teaching things like history and science who got their money from giving lectures which were subscribed to by the people who attended. Nobody attended. So what did they do? They had to make their fields into disciplines with exams, just like the ones that were already there, maths at Cambridge, classics at Oxford, and that's exactly what happened. So all of this makes the knowledge world different, and it leads to two things. Looking at systems of thought 
and which is archaeological in Foucault terms. What gets said in different ages and how is it said and what truth forms come out of it and what knowledge claims. And then there's the genealogical, which is what are the practices that underlie these huge changes when they happen. And Foucault himself, in these lectures called Truth as Juridical Forms, which he gives in Rio de Janeiro, two years before the French version of Discipline and Punish comes out, talk about two forms of truth that take, take effect first in the 1100s, which he calls inquiry, and then in the eight, around 1800 with examination. And my background in the pedagogy of exams was looking, saying, this is exactly it. We change the genealogical level of what we learn and how we learn it when the pedagogy changes in a significant way. Modern exams remake us as humans. They remake our knowledge fields. They are the means through which we now engage in dealing with climate change, with constructing things like the SDGs, and then working within that framework to try and find ways to get states and big corporations to act in the rational interests, which is this long-term one, which won't be solved by discounted cash flow analysis. So in that sense, I'm, my kind of Foucauldian work is to say, we must understand the archaeology of statements and how statements and knowledge statements change. And we can only do that if we understand the power of examining systems to remake us in the way we think. Systems of thought change at the level of how we learn to learn. If we learn under written graded examination, we see the world in terms of written graded examination. And if we see the world in that way, we will be inside a world with all these disciplines which we appropriate variously to try and deal with things like looking at SDG 13. So we came together from versions of the same sort of Foucauldian thing, but tried to work particularly with this. What gets said archeologically, who's doing the saying, people who've come through these modern examining systems and who have been successful in them. But this is one other thing I should have said too. When you remake humans in this new written, graded, examined mode, Perhaps the most significant transformation that takes place, and it's not complete, but it is hugely significant, is that people who take exams get graded on the performance that they do in the exam. Females can take these exams. And the beginning of systematic women's education, first in higher education, largely, then in schools, then as mass education systems, all takes place after 1800. It all takes place within this and looked at some of that in the US colleges where it's clear that girls who do exams and do well cannot be refused the accolade of you, you are very smart. They don't like it and there's all the glass ceiling things that are still there, but you have a new validation as a human subject because you've succeeded through the games and truth game that we now have to play through education. And I do think that's huge. And so this kind of embeds it in the process of kind of liberalism, the history of liberalism mm -hmm. and kind of um, the, if you, I think what you said, if you, if you play by the rules, you know, you can make it in this kind of new liberal meritocracy and that breaks up some of the more historical kind of um, boundaries and classifications and I suppose we're, we're sitting in a little bit of that history at University of Birmingham because this the University of Birmingham Business School was the uh, female hall of residence. Yeah, uh, the first ever uh, yes. female hall, to, hall of residence Indeed. in any British university. Um, we're sitting in its lovely library. Um, but yeah, I suppose that brings us back as well in the sense that there's all kind of, we should add that, you know, oppressions and hierarchies that are still embedded into these new knowledge forms. It's, yeah. It certainly doesn't um, sort of, 
it's, it's, it would take a critical perspective on that, I suppose. Um, you've also written, I think, with Anne-Christine Franson and Susan Bassanet about this idea of non-glottographic statements and, and the accounting representation. Um, what, what do you think that adds to the, you know, maybe the more traditional Foucauldian approach yeah. as a development? Yeah, well, I was just writing on this yesterday, trying to put it down. And I was, it, it's basically this. What we now know, going back to what I said about the token accounting and its transition into uh, clay tablet accounting, where the accounting statements already name things and count them before you reach writing, but can do that in a new way once there is a form of writing. Because what you then get is you get separate linguistic signs and separate counting signs, which is precisely what we have today. First clay tablet accounts have various things like there's, there'll be um, perhaps cylinder seal representations of somebody who is in charge of the account within a particular accounting statement. Then you will get what's being named as the objects. Then you will get the counting, signi uh, the counting signifiers or signs over here. So we have, here's, here's a person that's important. Here's what's being measured. Here's the number and we've got an accounting statement. Now, as soon as we do that, we've got the separate linguistic and numerical signifiers. And we are clearly making what can be value statements at that level of this is what's happened up to now and can be used as a basis for projecting what we could do next. And that all happens in the Mesopotamian world. But what's taken place at the level of understanding languaging as a result of this is we have this thing, a first writing used to be called proto writing in the sense of not quite writing. But it's the first writing that occurs. It, Mesopotamia, 3300 BCE, 3300 to 3000, 300 years, where we have not huge amounts of material, but enough for the what is being said to be decoded. And all it does is it names things and counts them, except that there are some, a level of texts that survive which are, they used to be called word list texts. They're the pedagogic texts that you need to study to understand what the different signifiers are for different naming signs. And outside that, you must have some sort of study of how to use the metrological systems that are depicted using in cuneiform uh, number forms. So we have statements that name and count that are now invisible script, could be called inscription at this point, not before, there's all this accounting before, there isn't inscription, but there we are, and it's a proto-writing. Now this caused huge problems for what's writing. And basic thing of the long story is, we have assumed, particularly in this alphabetic West, where alphabetic writing goes back to the Greeks and the first writing in Greek, the first literature is Homer. We have assumed that speech is the linear flow like this. Writing is the linear flow approximating what's done phonetically in speech. And this is what's been called the philological view of language. We have a language which is spoken. Then when we have a writing system, it could be Chinese characters, could be a sort of syllabic systems like the early Semitic ones, could be an alphabet which has got consonants and vowels. But anyway, you've got a version of what's said in a written form. So it's assumed that there's speech and writing. There is in organizational discourse today, when they do this sort of analysis, including Foucauldian analysis, talk and text. We have what people say, and we got these linear text. And then we've got these other things, these accounting things, which are often called visualisms now. But they're not visualisms, they're statements. They are first writing. And what has happened partly in Foucault, partly through the people who were deciphering this first clay tablet accounting, is recognising that this is writing. 
but it's not a writing that is related to speech. It's only naming, only counting, and you can't speak it aloud to make sense of what it says. You have to read it silently. It has a, it has a syntax that was quickly realized, but it doesn't have verbs to make the syntax. You have statements that have got lines around them. So I'm just drawing a sort of set of lines or divided up by lines. The lines are the syntax that says, this is one statement, that's another one. And we still do that with accounts now. We put them inside boxes typically, or they're on pages, which were boxes once you got to double entry. So what this has caused is a big battle. What's writing? Is it just the traditional speech and written speech? Or do we have to call this proto-writing, as it has been called, a, a distinct like writing form? And one of the people involved in this about 20 years, no, 15 years ago, suggested that historians of writing had started calling writing that's like speech, glotographic writing, because it's a writing of what's said with the tongue, the glota in Greek. This scholar, Malcolm Hyman, came along and said, well, if they're gonna call that glotographic writing, we must call this writing, but it must be by definition not glotographic. So he came up with this term non-glotographic. And he realized, of course, that it doesn't just, the, that first accounting is non-glotographic, but so much of what we do use in modern knowledge, games and statements, is non-glotographic writing. Graphs, charts, statistics, equations, all of these, all the maths, in that sense, is a non-glotographic writing. You can't make sense of maths equations without reading them. You can't verbalize them aloud and convey what they are saying. So we've not been very good at understanding, actually what you've got is three statement modes in modern knowledge games. And that's, that was, we were doing, Rob Charnock and I, in the piece on the SDG 13, there was a, a hugely complex um, graph somewhere towards the end. I don't know if you can find it, but um, for those who would want to see it. Risks from climate, it's, it's a multiple graph. Relationship to figure six on page 1747. Relationship between risks from climate change, temperature change, cumulative carbon dioxide emissions, and changes in annual greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. 2014 chart. Now, one of the scholars on this ancient accounting said, this needs to be recognized, what this accounting is. This form of statement, the clay tablet accounting, says things that speech could never say. It expands the range of how we think because of what it produces in this hugely complex version on 1747. Um, we can, if we are sophisticated enough to know all the knowledge fields and the, the various sort of different namings that are here and how they're counted, we can make sense of that. But that's exactly the same as happening with the first accounting. So our position is there are three statement forms. If you are going to do things like organizational discourse, you can't just deal with talk and text in the traditional sense because these statement forms carry a lot of the truth claims within them. What's said there couldn't be said in either speech or narrative writing. And that's where we come back to Foucault, because Foucault, in his archaeolo archaeological work, The Archaeology of Knowledge, talks about statement forms. And he, this is 1969, so way before any of this work, when The Archaeology of Knowledge is published in French, he says, he's talking about how do you define the statement? He says, well, not all statements are in conventional linguistic form. He said, there are statements like um, the Linnaeus uh, pattern of the uh, botanical species. This is a book that has virtually no sentences in it, but there's, it's full of statements. He then goes on, the accounts book. He says, the 
uh, other sorts of distribution, the I uh, just doing it yesterday, so I can't remember the quote, but he has a, a significant quote where he says there are all these knowledge statements that are not sentences, that are not speakable, in fact. So that's the piece that we started to, to work from, that we have to understand that there are three statement forms and two. If we're going to understand what's being said in a field like accounting, we have to take the non glotographic statement forms of the accounts and everything that goes along with that these days into account in making sense of what's being said and what what remains a silence. So in that respect, we think that there's an awful amount that hasn't been happening that could be happening within critical accounting by recognizing there are three statement forms, not just talk and text. It's not just speech and writing. One form of writing derives from speech. The other form of writing has nothing to do with it. And indeed, there's this famous quote that's much used from Walter Ong saying, writing restructures consciousness for humans. And I think that that's right. But the writing that restructures the consciousness is the non glotographic one. As soon as you've got that, and you've got this clay tablet accounting, you get the beginnings of the first states. You get states, you get cohorts of workforces who have norms of performance, not in the modern form, but they are already there. We just discover more intense ways of, of doing, the, doing these things. Now, going through that, when, what does that have to say to critical accounting? Well, our view is, but one thing it's saying is there's a whole possible new lease of life for critical accounting. Don't all have to do non glotographic statements the way we do, but to recognize that there are three forms of statement within two registers, speech and writing, can make a huge difference. Not least because so much of critical accounting, even where it does Foucauldian power knowledge works, when you read the pieces, the accounting only has a sort of secondary support role to play. The big things are happening, either at the level of institutional change or the sociological or the level of the state. But in fact, we should be seeing, no, accounting is constitutive of ways of knowing. Accounting is constitutive of the possibility of the modern firm in the sense of management and cost accounting alongside double entry bookkeeping now as financial accounting which it never was before. And in that sense, I think it's quite timely because, well, about four or five years ago, at, I think it was one of the IPA conferences, uh, or maybe it was a CPA conference. Well, it was the one in Toronto. There was at York University, um, IPA being the perspectives on accounting conference and CPA being the critical perspectives on accounting conference, but we have that these days. Feeling that the initial impetus had kind of rather got lost. There begins to be a lot of ritualized ways of doing Foucault, which I always notice if they're doing more the Miller and Rose kind of Foucault, look who's cited as the sources. You get Foucault with a, a date for a year of one of his works. No page numbers, of course, that's what we get. But then we get Miller and Rose, and then we get Mitchell Dean or something, and we get lots of people who aren't Foucault. In fact, you stop having Foucault very quickly. In the stuff we do, there's an awful lot of citing Foucault because we're trying to stay close to the archaeology of statements, now in three statement forms, and the genealogy of new modes of thinking and acting in different eras when things like examination and inquiry come about. And in fact, you have one more piece in you, not this piece, is that one, our accounting history review piece. This is a piece called L'état c'est moi, the state is me, or what? On the interrelations of accounting, managing, and governing in the French administrative monarchy, which is Louis XIV in the Colbert era in the middle of the 1600s. And what comes out very clearly there 
Colbert knows double entry bookkeeping. He comes from a financial family, basically for 20 years from 1661 to 1683 when he dies, he runs the French state for Louis. When he dies, Louis gets rid of all of the Colbert stuff and reverts to running it himself. But Colbert knows double entry bookkeeping, but can't use it to run the state because every minister has their own budget. Colbert can run everything inside his own world, but he can't coordinate everything. And he can't run the modern state. But what does he use as a technique to make uh, Louis so wealthy and powerful? He uses inquiry, this other form. And that piece is largely about how does inquiry come into being integral to how we think and act in the medieval French West initially, and then Italian. And how does it get used to do things like coordinate states or run businesses in mercantile setups? So that's another part of the story. We've got something huge changes with double entry bookkeeping from the 1200s on down to the 18th century, to the 1800s, to the 1700s, really. Then we get this modern way in which double entry bookkeeping becomes financial accounting, we get capital categories worked out. We actually therefore are able to get profit defined appropriately enough to be able to measure profit as return on capital employed or return on investment, which you can't do before um, because nobody knows what the capital is. Nobody's interested in the capital in that sense. They want to know where their assets are. They want to know what their credit position is. Can I trust my partners in various enterprises that I'm in. So it's all that sort of thing. Those questions, I think, are crucial, but being able to approach them, valorizing accounting or recognizing how constitutive accounting is in these different eras so that we can see in the way that Foucault sets out, there's a certain set, way of set, saying things, a certain set of knowledge statements that are made in these different eras that change radically. New ob objects, you move from natural history to biology and um, the origin of species type work. You put man inside the world and you name and count man in all of the ways that accounting makes possible, which are not all seen, as you said, James, absolutely, not seen as accounting, but academic grading, intelligence testing, sports, performance evaluations, identifying you as a subject within a population, and also identifying you as a desiring subject, which is a big Foucault term, within these populations, who therefore has to be managed in terms of your desires, whether they're acceptable or not, and the fact that there's a distribution of desires across this whole population, the world we live in. Well, I, mean, I think it's fair to say you've got a, an incredibly rich uh, area of study, you know, everything from Mesopotamia to the Egyptian to the medieval Renaissance and uh, uh, 18th and 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and I think what you're saying about the non-glossographic statement and the way in which you've been using Foucault's work recently, I think it adds kind of that theoretical depth and, and some of the methodologies of Foucault, I suppose, to some of the ongoing interest in the critical accounting field in relation to inscription devices, going all the way back to using Latour's laboratory life, the transformation of statement types. Um, so I think it's interesting that you're really focusing in on this question from yeah. a Foucauldian perspective. Yeah. Um, and I think these key questions are high stakes now, aren't they? You know, you're looking yes. at sustainability, climate yes. change. I know the ICAW are looking at bringing sustainability into their curricula curriculum uh, in, a, in a more comprehensive way. As um, we are here in Birmingham. As we are here, we're doing too. exactly the same sort of exercise, aren't we? We're reviewing our syllabus to look at climate change and all of the SDGs and how that is integrated into our syllabus. Um, I guess if I could just finish on one brief question, how critical is critical accounting going forward, do you think? Well, I think it's got a possibility to be critical of the way it's been critical up to now. 
if I had one brief coda point that I would make. First time I've really ever presented the notion of the glotographic and the non-glotographic and accounting coming from, um, well, outside the world of speech and glotographic writing. It, it comes from a different point. Somebody asked the question, so what does this make of Derrida and Archie writing? And this was something I'd, I'd been thinking about and we'd been talking about for quite a while before that. And I had the answer ready right there, which is, if you understand Derrida and this notion of Archie writing as developed in, of grammatology, he says, well, we've first we got speech and then we have writing. How are we to understand speech in a world of writing if we go beyond the metaphysics of presence and thinking that the speaking is what matters? And that's where he comes up with this notion of Archi writing, which is a writing that's a conceptualized writing that has to be there before speech in order for speech to emerge and for, well, photographic writing to emerge. I said, what happens with Archi writing is it becomes inadequate as an explanation of the world we live in of speech and writing, precisely because it's not doesn't even recognize the possibility of something coming as a writing, not from speech. So it just goes back over from photographic writing to speech to being there before that. But this other writing comes from outside that universe. It comes from over here. Well, that's how we would argue it. Doesn't mean you can't remake our key writing, but then our key writing has got to allow for the fact that something can come from not speech. It's a being, saying things that are radically other than speech, that speech can't say. That's a major epistemological problem that generates out from accounting, from recognizing accounting as being this weird thing that doesn't fit. And insofar as that's the case, then accounting becomes something that philosophically needs to be engaged with. Because it also, it's, I don't know, speech act theory and performativity, very significant, but it's one of these fields which is produced in glotographic writing to talk about speech. So Seward's approach to linguistics. I'm going to talk about parole, speech, but I do it in writing. <laughs> it's all very weird, but this, I think that there's one of the big ways conceptually epistemologically um, that accounting can go forward and that's one of the things that the person who de was involved in deciphering Clay Tabley's accounting and was very Piagetian concerned about how do we make sense of human cognition called Peter Dameron he said we have in under trying to understand writing to move beyond this Philo philology view, speech and writing. We have to develop a historical epistemology view. And of course, Foucault is largely about historical epistemologies. It's different systems of thought entail different epistemologies. And it's the historical shift in practices genealogically, which for me, right from the start, before I was even in accounting, was formed through pedagogies, shaping how we learn to learn. That's where I think there's fantastic possible work to be done in ways that I can't possibly imagine, because if you feed this in, it's going to take people beyond where they are already. That's the technology studies and the influence on critical accounting research yes. is, 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 a, is a big and developing area as well. Uh, that, that's actually the other thing with like, doing the Latourian type work out of STS work is it does assume, understandably, because Latour and Woolga and those around them, like Calon, were starting out something new from within science. But it doesn't necessarily make sense to apply science categories to accounting, because accounting what produces pure maths out of this accounting is teaching the accounting that they begin to get to pure maths in, in Mesopotamia and Egypt. So, again, we've just got to reverse some of the polarities that we've been assuming mean that, oh, well, if we're doing critical accounting, it's, it's important, but the accounting's secondary and we're a bit secondary to all these big important knowledge fields.
out there. And part of this has always been about saying, what have I worked in? I've worked in pedagogy, education and accounting, two applied fields that have nothing of interest to say to us apart from their good support systems. No. Thank you.